the martyrdom of a prophet. We're up to winter 1844, and the prophet Joseph Smith is also lieutenant general of the Nauvoo Legion, mayor of a city which has become the largest and most flourishing in all of Illinois, revelator to the saints, and a man whose time is running out. To Elizabeth Rollins, he confided in the spring of 1844, I must seal my testimony with my blood. A testament is not of force, says the New Testament, Paul speaking, until the death of the testator. The depth of that doctrine is beyond me. Why death should somehow be the full glorifying sanction of life, why blood must be shed as the price of freedom and of truth and most of all the witness of Christ. But so it is and he taught that principle. We can also find comments from the brethren who became anxious about his life. So often did he express the sentiment that they would carry on in his absence. Brigham Young, for one, says, I heard him say it. I heard him say many times that he would not live to be 40. But I felt that my faith would outreach the promise and that I somehow could prevent it. Wilford Woodruff, who had conversation with him just after the April Conference, 1844, recalls that he was then sent east, as were ten of the twelve, on missions, and that the prophet, this time saying goodbye, seemed to linger, and then looking him through and through, said, Brother Wilford, you must go, and if you do not, you will die. The way he said, you, Wilford understood him to be saying, I will not be here when you return. There were some who, on the other hand, believed that so often had he escaped the vilifyings and attacks of his enemies that he was invincible. They really believed that the prophet could not die. And in one sermon, he said, in response to that, there are some who believe that, but it is not true. And then in that sermon, he added, and my work is finished. I am as liable now to die as any other man. Backing up now to the winter, he had manifested four predominant anxieties and had done all in his power to relieve them, to do what he had been commanded. The first anxiety related to the temple, he yearned that it be finished, and he acted that way. For example, he with Hiram went house to house to every home in Nauvoo, in the role, we would say now, of home teachers. and recommitted the saints to give of time and means to the speedy erection of that building. He himself gave sermons, and so did Hiram. And Hiram said, I cannot explain to you why this is so important, but it is important, and great blessings depend upon its completion. He did some of the physical work itself, and Emma, his wife, records that he often, as she puts it, rode out meaning that he got on his horse, old Charlie, sometimes accompanied by his dog, Major, and rode up on the hill to that commanding eminence and watered the walls with his tears, praying that the saints would be able to complete it and receive the blessings therein before they were driven and scattered. For he anticipated and prophesied they would be driven and scattered. Joseph's anxiety by and about the temple was compounded by his anxiety concerning the records of the church, that they be kept, preserved, and accurately transmitted. That was the responsibility of several of his scribes. He had at the time nearly six who were working round the clock to bring the history up to date. One of them, as I have mentioned earlier, was Willard Richards, faithful good man who burned candles often until midnight, writing with his quill pen. Joseph said after a dream, I told Willard that the history must go ahead, 
before all else. To several others, he spoke of the necessity of accurate record-keeping and lamented in a priesthood meeting that we had not kept adequate minutes and said, in justice, we have in this sense offended the Lord, for he has whispered and given us inspiration, and we have not prized it enough to record it. And now new cases arise that that could have helped us with, and we are left helpless. And then he said, I prophesy, brethren, if we do not do this from now on, we will fall into the hands of our enemies. One can ask, was it all that important? And one can quickly answer, if all of the prophets 12 in Nauvoo had recorded at the time the meeting where he rolled off the responsibility upon them and charged them in what he called his last charge to go forward now in building the kingdom, any claim that he intended someone else to succeed to the presidency of the church would be, by contemporary documents, completely refuted. But only one of the twelve recorded that meeting, even within a recent recollection, and most didn't say much about it until several years later. And thus arises the liability to the charge. It is a false charge, but we are vulnerable to it that this was an afterthought, that in fact Joseph didn't want the twelve to succeed and wanted instead someone else. Crucial? Yes. In addition to the record anxiety, he had an anxiety to teach in summary roles all that had been heretofore made known and to make sure that they understood it. To that end, as I have earlier said, he spent much of every day for three months with the twelve and others of the leaders of the church, often in council also with husbands and wives, sharing, summarizing, reiterating the established, restored truth and ordinances. And as the record shows, he gave the higher ordinances of the temple, even though the temple was not complete to certain of the more faithful and true in Nauvoo. We know of at least 70 couples, in addition to the nine of whom I spoke in that occasion when, in 1842, in the upper room of his store, he did it. Seventy who received the special higher blessings of the temple even before it was completed. But by now it was far along. It was, as some said, up to the square. And there was a baptismal font which had been dedicated for purposes of baptism for the dead. So, to summarize thus far, temple anxiety, record anxiety, teaching anxiety. And then finally, there was his major concern that the saints understand his own role and be willing to do what in the extremes they might be required to do. Strangely, we have throughout the days of the last of May and early June 1844 unusual optimism in many who were associated with the prophet, and among them his brother Hiram, who seemed to feel, even down to the time that they were in jail in Carthage, that all would work out, that this was just one more of the many crises from which they had emerged, in radical contrast to which the prophet, beginning early in June, has all kinds of ominous presentiments. Now we reach the crisis moment and the tinderbox and the trigger. You're aware that the attitudes of some in the Nauvoo period were first bitter and then joined in league with the underworld. Understand again, Nauvoo was the largest city in Illinois. Counterfeiters, blacklegs, slave traders, cheaters, and every other kind of disreputable and criminal type found their way there trying to break it open, trying to exploit, 
trying to gull recent and uh, sometimes naive converts from far and near. And it was difficult to know as you walked the streets of Nauvoo who were the saints and who weren't. Because of that underworld, but worse, because of apostasy, people living there who now hated the church, the prophet's life became jeopardized. William Law, we must be specific, had first cried at the prophet's announcement of the principle of plural marriage and with his arms around his neck pled that he not teach it. For, said he, if you won't, if only you won't, this will become the greatest Christian church of the century. But if you do, the consequences will be terrible. The prophet also in tears replied, what you say may be true, Brother William, but I have no choice. I must teach it. I have been commanded, and the Lord has told me that keys will be turned against me if I do not. How early did he know that this would happen, that plural marriage would be restored, at least as early as 1832? We're now into 1842, ten years later. He has now introduced it. Over that, William Law became bitter. Then, ironically, was excommunicated for adultery. And then became so bitter that he literally organized his own church and began to fight back. He and his brother, the Higbees and the Fosters, they are the sixum responsible for the publication on June 7, 1844, of what is known as the Nauvoo Expositor. The word expositor meaning expose sheet, expose sheet. It's all written in vilification of the prophet. It is not temperate. It says, how can he preach virtue when he himself has drunk from the poisonous cup? It says, there has never been a worse dictator since Nero and Caligula, etc. You know the history. I will not dwell on the detail. The city council met According to their understanding of law, they decided it was by their own out, uh, by their own charter, a public nuisance, and that they not only had authority to confiscate the paper, but to destroy the press. Precisely that, by the way, had happened to us at Independence. Our press had been destroyed. And some students of law today would argue that they were perfectly within the law of the time that there were precedents for it, and that the way they did it was indeed legal. But both friends and enemies of the prophet have assumed that that act, whether legal or not, was the most unwise and inflammatory act of his life and culminated in his death. One elder, his name was George Lobb, records that because there was murmuring among the saints when that was done, called a meeting, invited them, and then said, in effect, the Lord showed me at daylight, meaning this just wasn't something he conjured in the dreams of the night, what would happen if that press were not destroyed and that the blood of the saints would be shed. And to prevent that, we did what we did. Not all believed him, I'm sure, and he did not add then, which he could have, that though He had by that act preserved their lives for a time. He had done so at the cost of his own. They had said publicly, even before the decision was made, if those Mormons raise their hand against this press, they can date their doom from that point. They threatened much more than they ever did, but among their threats was that there wouldn't be a stone left on the temple, that they would burn all of Nauvoo, that there would not be one smith left in the state and that the Mormons would be killed or driven. Well, that was indeed a crisis. The prophet was twice acquitted for what had been done, he and those who with him did it, Squire Wells being the second to acquit him. That did not satisfy anyone. And you're aware that eventually the governor himself, that goes all the way to the state house, not only is unsatisfied with those legal procedures, but insists that the prophet go to the very hotbed of the worst opposition in the state, namely Carthage. Why? Well, Ford explained in his original letter just to placate the masses. But as it turned out, it was a trial also, and that was a mock trial, 
They were charged with treason, so they set bail for Joseph and Hiram at $10,000. To his everlasting credit, Stephen Markham sold his house instantly, put his family in a tent, and provided the money. And when the enemies felt that they had been met and had to fi figure another way, they then swore out further charges and put the Smith brothers in jail. May I now back up and talk about the preparatory events in the prophet's own inner life. He had spoken, you recall, in the King Follett discourse of the great secret, the great and glorious truth, both that God himself has become what he is and that man in the image of God may become like him. It would help us with those who find this blasphemy if we worded it more carefully, if we said not, we believe that God is like a man. We said, God is like Christ. No genuine Christian can be thoroughly offended at that statement. But we must go on to say, and as are God and his Christ, so man may be. He taught it. That too offended many. And that discourse, though we have published it more than any other of the prophet's public utterances, still occasions some difficulty. But toward the end of it, he issued that classic statement, you do not know me, you do not know my heart. I cannot write my history, I shall not undertake it. Now the history of the church he wrote as he was involved in it, but the biography of his inner world he kept locked within his bosom. And then he said, when the trump of the archangel shall sound, and I am weighed in the balance, you will all know me then. I add no more. God bless you. Amen. Many were saying then, as they had in Kirtland and before, that here was a fallen prophet. Occasionally, with a twinge of humor, he would say, Well, I'd better be a prophet than never to, or fallen prophet than never to have been a prophet at all. But in order to quell the disputes that were arising through the efforts of the laws, uh, he was informed by two young men, both heroes in their own time, a young Master Scott and Harrison, who were made privy to the meetings that the laws were holding and reported back what they heard and came the last time to say that at that meeting, every man present and woman had been asked to come forward, put a hand on a Bible, and say they would not rest until they had washed their hands in the blood of Joseph Smith. The prophet wept. And by the way, they told him they were going to that meeting and that they were afraid there would be some such act. And he had said to them, Brethren, they may threaten you. They may even take your lives. But brethren, if you have to die, die like men. They went willingly and they didn't have to. But he now knew by natural knowledge as well as by the presentiments what was happening. He can be described properly, as B.H. Roberts does, as a man who lived his life in crescendo. There was no diminuendo. There was no diminishing, but all was and instead increase. And there was one last discourse. After the laws had prophesied he would never speak from the stand again, he arose, and though the rain at the end shortened the talk, he delivered a masterful discourse on the plurality of gods. And on the testimony he had borne from the beginning that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are three separate personages. And in that discourse, he said he yearned to preach once more. And that would be on a passage out of the Revelation of John pertaining to our becoming kings and priests. It was in crescendo, but the final moment of that discourse, he said, brothers and sisters, love one another and be merciful to your enemies. And he repeated it three times. And then was the moment the discourse before the Legion. Some of our historians have candidly observed this was Joseph Smith 
as a man. This was humanity coming out. This wasn't really the prophet. He stood, as they said, on the frame, the frame of the unfinished Nauvoo mansion, or Nauvoo house. And before a group, many of them in uniform, he again said, and he'd done it twice before, that now the moment had been reached when he would no longer submit to the efforts of mobocracy. He summarized how he had been driven as a row on the mountains all his life, that they had given him no rest, that when they took away the rights of the saints, he would fight for them. When they took away his own, he would submit. And he unsheathed his sword and said, I call God to witness what I have said. Well, if you think that was inflammatory, you'll be helped to read the journals of those who were there. They speak of the prophet as calm. They speak of him as concerned in love for his brethren. And he did cry out at one point, how many of you here would die for me? And many shouted, I. And he gratefully said, I know, I know you would. And then in a wave of the assurance of his own soul, he said, and I will die for you. My blood shall flow on the ground like water. She would know that and understand what was inside of him in love for his brethren. You will understand why his soul was wounded to the core when men came across the river at Montrose and said, You are a coward. You said that you would stand up for us, and now when trouble comes, you are the first one to run. And that's when he replied, If my life is of no value to my friends. It is of none to me. That was when the resolve was made to return. And you remember that he had had light in his decision to leave. We can always say that, of course, the death of the prophet was brought on by his enemies. I'm afraid we must also say that it was brought on by some of his own. By some who could not, at that stage, after all they had received from him, believe that he was really a prophet when he said, all they want now is Hiram and me. They will come here and they will not harm a hair of your heads. We will go away and they will not find us and you will be safe. They could not believe it. The pot was boiling. Affidavits were coming every hour on the hour, naming the greater number of men that had come from Missouri and were waiting, the mobs that were being gathered, the cannons they had available, the threats they were making. And in the flood of that evidence, his statement, you will be safe, could not be believed. More than a hundred, one witness says, left Nauvoo after the June 17th. And the prophet looked as they left and did say, Look at the cowards. Now he himself was called a coward. And against the light, he came back. You remember the decision that was made? Porter Rockwell, when he asked him what he thought, said the uh, 19th century phrase, You make your bed, I'll lie with you. Whatever you say goes, Joseph. Hiram, you're the oldest, what do you think? Hiram, let us go back. The prophet had read the letter indicating the governor's request and had said, if we do that, we are dead men. No, no, says Hiram. Let us go back and trust in God. We will go, the prophet replied, but we shall be butchered. One who watched them row across the river that day, a young man, says, and perhaps it's a dramatic retrospect, that he felt something in the air, that there was, there was something threatening about this. The son, Hiram's son, Joseph, felt it and could never quite speak of it the rest of his life without weeping. The wives, Mary Fielding and Emma, weren't quite as much concerned because so often uh, their husbands had come back and they, of course, did all they could to soothe them. 
prophet was concerned enough about Emma that he wrote three letters from the jail. And the last one speaks of the right all men have to defend their brethren. And he says, should the last extremity arise, and then doesn't finish the sentence. Well, they changed their clothing and then received word from Jedediah M. Grant that they must leave awfully early and they hadn't had any sleep for two nights because the governor wanted them in Carthage by noon the next day. That meant a 6 a.m. departure. There are little moments in those last hours that are so significant, I must only mention a few. There is the statement of John Taylor's wife. She went down when they returned to surrender state arms at the governor's request. Uh, she was in the Smith home when the prophet went again to say goodbye. And he pled with Emma on that occasion to go with him, even though she was not well. They called it the ague, we'd say, as they sometimes did chills and fever. She also was expecting a child, not feeling well. He begged her to come anyway. She said no. And as he turned away, he said an interesting thing. Well, if they do not hang me, I do not care how I die. I believe Willard Richards overheard that statement. And that that is why, in the last moment, he offered, and he meant it, think of it, to be hung in the prophet's stead. It also tells us that he hadn't yet been made to know exactly how this was to occur. And there had been threats, one of them published in the newspaper, that they would, as the letter said, make catfish meat of him. You do not know how ruthless some of those men were. They did it with slaves. They encouraged black men to run away from their masters. And then they would sell them, pocket the money, have them run away again, sell them, pocket the money, telling the slave that after the third time, when, as they said, he was hot, they would then share the money and he would be free. Instead of that, they killed them and cut them up and threw them in the Mississippi. That was making catfish meat of a man. There was also a reward issued by the Missourians that they had a price on his head and that they would pay it for its delivery like John on the platter. So he did not know how he would end his life, but he did not relish who of us would have the thought of hanging. And then there was the moment with Daniel H. Wells not feeling well himself. The prophet stopped. He was not been a member of the church. Squire Wells, I want you to cherish my memory. And not think me the worst man either. Daniel H. Wells could never speak of that incident without weeping. And he became one of our great ones. But he had to give up his family in order to join the church later. And then there was the moment with the little girl who overheard the prophet say as they stopped to ask for a drink of water that morning by the Rosencrantz, if I don't come back, always remember I love you. This little girl felt that to her soul and fled and wept on her bed. And then there was that surveying of the entire valley, looking up at the temple, when the prophet said, according to Jedediah, this is the loveliest place and the best people under the heavens. Little do they know the trials that await them. On the road itself, the road to Carthage, there were three other sentences that are revelatory, not part of the official history. Isaac Haight records that at one point he was so weighed down, he turned to Hiram and said, Oh, Hiram, let's go back to Nauvoo and die together there. John Lowe Butler records that at one point, about four miles out, he commanded, and that's the only way he could get them to obey. But many who had ridden that far with him turn around and go back. They said, no, Joseph, we'll go with you. We'll take what you take. No, he said, you must go. And John Lowe Butler says, as I turned and as we rode away, I felt, as I suppose the ancient disciples of Christ felt, when he said, I must be crucified. 
And then the third, that moment when they had stopped at the fellow's farm after a group had come on horseback from Carthage. And he went in and signed some documents that made it possible for the arms to be surrendered. When he said, as I have earlier quoted, I am not afraid to die. Yet the official record shows us that again and again he said to his brethren in the next three days, I have had forebodings, that's my word, but that's the approximate one, forebodings in this time that I've never had before, and they have depressed me. There were many efforts made, legal efforts, even at that stage to relieve the prophet from his unjust incarceration. None of them availed. Dan Jones went and personally talked to the governor, explaining what he had heard in the secret meetings of those around. And the governor said, oh, my friend, you're imagining this. We have the testimony of a non-Mormon, Dr. Southwick, that a meeting was held only two days before. A representative of every one of the states of this then smaller United States. What about? About the political campaign for Joseph and Sidney Rigdon had been named as candidates for the president and vice president of the United States. Why? Well, it gives you the reasons. I won't take the time. Except that it enabled us to dramatize and teach the gospel in a way we could not have otherwise. He did not, of course, expect to be elected. But now, enough support was being generated and showing up in the Eastern papers that these men now meet to do what? To stop the political career of Joe Smith. And the Missourians present said, in effect, if you want us to do the job, we'll do it. And the others said, if you do do it, you will never be brought to justice. If you don't stop him this time, if he isn't elected this time, he will, or likely may, next time. So there were political motives as well as others in this struggle. But the efforts with the governor failed. John Taylor, a man of great character and spine, saw the situation and was so indignant, he said, you let me have a hundred men from the Navajo Legion and I'll tear this jail down. The prophet said no. One of the brethren who came to visit offered to change clothes with the prophet, to pull a switch, and then the prophet could get away on his horse and all would be well. The prophet turned that down. J.W. Woods was assigned to go to uh, Jesse Thomas, one of the circuit judges of the Illinois, who had promised the prophet that if he would send responsible Mormons into each community and explain the actions of recent days, that they would be pacified. Woods was asked to go and find out what the results of that were and found that that hope, too, was false. For Green and others said in his presence, don't you think it's better for two men or more to die than for a whole neighborhood to be in an uproar. Two or three of the prophet's non-Mormon friends, one of them a sea captain, one of them a dentist, were sent missiles asking to come and testify in his behalf. All of them tried, none of them successfully. The only thing he therefore had between him and the final scene was a pistol, which Cyrus Wheelock had brought in. And when Hiram said, I do not like to see such things used, the prophet replied, neither do I but we may need to defend ourselves. Many anti-Mormon tracts have said it certainly is no example to the Christian world that a man should have claimed to have died as a martyr for Christ who used a gun in the last hours of his life. They do not know either the background or the sequel. The background in a word is that the prophet had promised those brethren in the name of the Lord that he would defend them even if it meant his life. Had he been all alone in the Carthage jail, the story might be different. But he was not. He was there with two members of the Twelve, John Taylor and Willard Richards, Willard Richards being over 300 pounds, the largest target and the only one not injured, and with his brother Hiram. And he did defend them as he promised. In fact, we now know from the records that the first man up the stairs that day, anxious and eager, was met by a fist and rolled back down. That fist was Joseph Smith's. Inside the door, they had nothing to defend themselves with except those pistols and two walking sticks which they used to divert the rifles up. Some of them went off in the ceiling as a result. But when Jacob Hamlin went to that room the next day and counted the 
pot marks of the balls that were shot through, well over 56 were there. And all that shooting occurred, according to Willard Richards, in less than two minutes. Four, actually five balls, entered both Hiram and Joseph, and four more, John Taylor. It was a volley, an explosive volley. We know that the night before that, the prophet had had some private conversations with the remaining brethren. We know that he had borne his last testimony to the guards of what? Of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, he said not long before this, is just what it purports to be. And for this testimony, I expect to give an accounting before the bar of God. We know also that he had pled three times with Hiram for Hiram to leave him and go back. Hiram could only say, Joseph, I cannot leave you. And Hiram, it turned out, was the first to go down. Only this much remains, and I must be through. The question raised, how did the prophet make the decision, which he did make, to leave that room or to try to leave it through the window? There have been films that have depicted Joseph somehow falling off balance out through a large glass plate window. There is no such window. This was a jail. Even the upstairs had walls as thick as two feet. It was a small window, and Joseph was a large man. And to get through it required great effort. It is Willard Richards who uses the strangest adverb in the whole account when he says that after that pistol, which misfired twice, was empty, the prophet calmly, that's a strange word, calmly, dropped it, and went to the window. One man outside the jail, and I don't know how anybody could hear anything in such a fracas, claims he heard the prophet cry, O Lord, what shall I do? How fast can a man's mind work in such circumstances? What was going through his? It was certain death at the door. That was clear. It was certain death at the window because bullets were coming through it and John Taylor had just been blasted under the bed, writhing in pain with four wounds. And yet, he decided to get out. Willard Richards believed, hoping that if he could, it might save the lives of those who still were alive. Whether that was his intent or not, he was hit twice from behind maybe three times, and managed, even though he was, to pull himself up and out and then fell from the window. He's out, he's out, someone shouted, and all who had been at the top of the stairs receded and came down. Shoot him, shoot the damn rascal, said Levi Williams, and they shot four times more. One account says that the prophet died with a smile. Perhaps also he was conscious long enough to know that the promise he had made to Willard Richards, Willard, you will stand one day in a literal hailstorm of bullets and not be harmed. Do you believe it? Willard had said no. But it was true. And John Taylor would, perhaps he knew, become the third prophet, seer, and revelator, and would live long enough to write a hymn, Oh, give me back my prophet dear, and would himself be twice martyred, dying, in effect, once at Carthage and recovering, and then dying again in exile, because he would not compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ. But now we return to the explicitly prophetic words of that last hymn or song. It was in the late days of Nauvoo, the prophet's favorite, a poor wayfaring man of grief. And the last two lines are, These deeds shall thy memorial be. Fear not, 
thou didst them unto me. The saints could not be comforted for a time. The morning, the black miasmic depression that descended upon Nauvoo was overwhelming. When Mother Smith, Hiram's wife, heard the high-pitched voice of Porter Rockwell riding on a sweaty horse past midnight and shouting, they've killed them, they've killed them, they've killed Joseph and Hiram. And she screamed, and young Joseph wept. All Nauvoo knew. Some immediately felt bitter and wanted vengeance. Some who had command of the Nauvoo Legion went and asked immediately that they be summoned. But the leaders had been told to stay home by the prophet. And that was that. Letters came from Carthage, from both Willard and John. And uh, to reassure John Taylor's family, Willard Richard said, uh, Taylor, slightly wounded. <laughs> and peace, in spite of anguish, prevailed. Barley P. Pratt, just to name one of the many who felt forebodings that day, even at the hour it was happening, walked depressed across the prairie until he could hardly stand it and finally knelt and prayed for comfort. And it was made known to him that it was true what was being rumored, that Joseph and Hiram had in fact given their lives, but that he was to go back rapidly to Nauvoo and to tell the saints to do nothing until the Twelve had reassembled. Interestingly, only four days before, the Prophet had sent letters to all the Twelve saying, Return to Nauvoo immediately. Peace, I repeat, not war, came in the aftermath of the Prophet's death. The Mormons had power to, in effect, win in any skirmish had they so chosen. They who have been conspiratorially stereotyped as warlike and bitter and hostile and filled with vengeance demonstrated that they were not any of those. They were peaceful. And now, by way of testimony, I stood once years ago with a church history group outside the walls of that building. There is now a makeshift well that is uh, somewhat of a replica of the one that was there in 1844. It was a dark day, lowering clouds, and some rain. But there, standing, we were taught in an inspired way the details of the Prophet's last days. The Spirit that came upon me, I pray, will never be obliterated. I can summarize it thus, that the same Spirit that testifies to the souls of men that Jesus the Christ was the Son of God and that he gave his life willingly for the redemption of mankind, that same Spirit bears witness to the receptive soul that the prophet Joseph Smith was a prophet of Jesus Christ. One cannot truly say he knows the one and deny the other. No man can come to a testimony of the prophetic mantle of the prophet Joseph Smith without knowing Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And no man can have a testimony that Christ is Christ without, when he hears this name and knows even a little of his life, that he had a prophet named Joseph. I bear that testimony and add to it the witness that we too somehow, someday, must reach the point where we hold our physical life cheap, 
even to the point of being willing to lay it down in the image and pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are ye, said the Lord to the prophet early on, even if they do unto you as they have done unto me, for ye shall dwell with me in glory. And in 1842, and perhaps before, he had said, the prophet recorded it then, My son, I seal upon you your exaltation and prepare a throne for you with Abraham your father. In that same revelation he is told that the saints will not set upon him, but that in the end they too will have mercy upon him. For, says the Lord to them, Let no man set upon my servant Joseph, for he shall do the sacrifice which I require at his hands. I have wondered if among the things achieved by his honest death, free and clear and justly free and clear of his enemies, he yet came back. I have wondered if among the things accomplished were his own final redemption. We will live to know the twin truth if we do not know it now. Jesus is the Christ, and Joseph is his prophet. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.